All right, I'm going to read his bio just so you guys can hear a little bit about this. He's very humble, but he's, he's built a serious real estate business and, a, and an incredible real estate portfolio, investing portfolio. So this is what they tell us. Keith James is the managing partner at Coalition Group of KW, boasting, boasting a record of successfully overseeing real estate transactions exceeding $650 million in value. He has a proven track record guiding countless families to their dream homes. Just flew in this morning. Just flew in this morning. Out tonight. So tell us who you are, where you're from. Give us, give yeah. us the, the background of who you are. Yeah. So my name is Keith James, managing partner, one-third managing partner of the Coalition Properties Group. Um, I have, I'm blessed and honored to uh, manage that team with some amazing partners, Harrison Beecher and Ryan Butler. Um, we launched Coalition March of 2019. And um, to be quite frank with you, the reason we came together, because we all had our own individual successful businesses, but we didn't see anyone at the top of real estate that was black. So we wanted, to, we wanted some representation at the top in the DMV area. Um, I think one of the best quotes that we came up with was, you want to go fast, go alone, right? If you want to go far, go together. And that was very important. And there's a lot of people in DC that when we came together, they didn't like it. Three black guys coming together to start a mega team, um, it was tough, but uh, we, we, we fought through. And since 2019, we've sold over 1,500 homes, $650 million in volume. Most importantly, we facilitated a million dollars to charity, so that's important. That's amazing. Thank you. And just in case people didn't catch that, what year did you start in real estate? <laughs> I started real estate in 2017. So everything that we that we was talking about your whole body you've done in, in really under six years. Yes. That's pretty incredible. God is good. God is good. <laughs> so tell us a little bit, I'm gonna ask you about like current day. So you have the yeah. coalition, coalition group, which is part of Kidman Capital Properties in yep. Washington DC. And you've got tell us a little bit about your uh, your investment portfolio because we are talking about using a business to build wealth and then impact communities. Uh, so tell us present day what that looks like, just so everybody kind of gets an idea. And then I'm going to back up and ask you sort of just where you grew up and how you came to get where you are now. Yeah, so um, present day, I have about 175 doors. Um, 100 and probably 50 of those I manage with my partners, right? Uh, we bought 100 units in Douglasville, Georgia, 68 units in um, Augusta, Georgia. And then I have my small one to four portfolio in the DMV. Nice. All right, so we're going to ask, we're going to talk more about that yep. as far as I chat and we're on the panel together after lunch. So tell me now, just kind of back up, where were you born, yep. your upbringing, uh, and just sort of, we, you and I have talked about just some of these things. I want, I want to figure out where you started and how you got to be where you are. Yeah, I'm from a small town in Mississippi. Um, the town is so small, you know, when you meet people, you got to ask, you know, what's your last name? Because you might be kin to them before you date them, right? Uh, <laughs> You know about it. My, my grandmother fed everybody in the neighborhood, and that's kind of where my foundation come, came from. Uh, growing up, I was exposed to sports. Um, but the people that we looked up to in my neighborhood, um, they, didn't, they weren't real estate agents. They weren't business. Well, they were business owners, but they were drug dealers. Pharma pharmaceutical sales. <laughs> yep. Um, we, looked up to, we, looked, we looked up to, the, uh, to those guys because um, we didn't know what success was supposed to look like. That was the first, like they had the nice cars, you know, they had money. And so that was the first thing that we saw when it came to, came to success. And I'm so thankful for my family and my foundation because uh, my mom sacrificed a lot for me and she kept me out of trouble. I still fear my mom to this day. And uh, one thing she would tell me, and that helped me um, along the way was that before you come, when you go home, from, when you come home from school, and she wasn't there, when you come home from school, don't touch a football, don't touch a basketball, get your work done first. And that has always stuck with me. That's a, that's a good, uh, good lesson from a parent. But then after that, you obviously you went on to play basketball. Yeah, yeah. Um, went on to play college ball at Tuskegee University. Shout out to all the HBCUs out there. Um, and if it wasn't for sports, you know, I wouldn't have gotten outside of my neighborhood, to be honest with you. Um, and, and by me being exposed and by me, by me being able to uh, go to Tuskegee University, um, I met a lot of good people. And that's kind of where I developed the passion for business. And um, graduated college, and uh, I had this mentor. I was a part of 100 Black Men of America. And he kind of introduced the thing, real estate. I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know anybody who owned a home. Uh, I wasn't taught that in school. 
and I was not financially literate, but he said, Keith, I think you should get in real estate. My first year out of corporate America, I blew all of my money. And the reason I blew all of my money was because I never had money before. I, we, we weren't taught the tools to you know, manage money. We kind of just had to figure it out and learn as we go and learn on, on, on the fly, right? And uh, I got this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. The book changed my life. A month after reading that book, I bought my first property. And How old were you when you read that book? Uh, 22. Well, turning 23, so I bought my first property at 23. Yep. It's amazing how many people that you talk to that are successful in real estate investing that mention that book. That book yep. was also really impactful for me. Yep. And it made me sort of transition from someone that was maybe had a job even if I was self employed to yep. thinking, I gotta build some assets. I gotta do something so that one day, if I want to slow down or can't run as hard as I want to be in the same. You mentioned something earlier. You talked about impact. And the first property, the first portfolio I built, I bought in the neighborhood I grew up in. The reason, and I wasn't even living there at the time. I was living in Minnesota. But the reason I bought in the neighborhood I grew up in, number one, was of course to build a portfolio. But number two, most importantly, I wanted to show my friends and people that look like me that we don't have to always be tenants. We can also be landlords. And that was very, very important. <laughs> I love that. Talk about mentors. You talked about yeah. obviously, you know, the way you grew up and then kind of what we touched on already. You did have some positive mentors. You did have some, uh, you didn't have all positive mentors, you know, yep. but you did have something you latched onto. Tell us who the, like in what age did you, did you find these mentors, who they were, and then uh, and I'm gonna talk about present day, how you're giving back to mentoring youth and, and leaders of tomorrow. Absolutely. So uh, my grandfather, uh, my number one mentor. Um, he, at an early age, you know, was out there throwing the baseball with me, and he was a part of the 100 Black Men of America. And in seventh grade, I was like a protege of the 100 Black Men of America. So they would come into our schools and teach us about HBCUs, teach us about life, and kind of teach us a tool of like how to be a black kid in the neighborhoods that we were in, right? And he always would put me in front of people that I was a little uncomfortable. And the reason I was uncomfortable was because, you know, the formal setting, that wasn't my lane. You know, I was used to, I was used to sports, you know, being, being to myself, but he would always kind of bring the uncomfort out of me, which was very important. And uh, he taught me a lot. And he walked, to, he, he walked to work two miles for five years. And he always tell me to this day, uh, Keith, um, I walk so you can run. run. And uh, I'm thankful for that. And he's probably my biggest mentor. That's awesome. Yeah. And then uh, college, you developed another mentor in college. Yeah. We talking about who was that? And sort of what was the what was the advice that mentor gave you that you care with you, that you care with until today? Yeah. So uh, in, in college, Andrew Cologne, who uh, was my basically my real estate mentor, and uh, part of the greatest fraternity on earth, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Um, <laughs> It's all right. He, he was the one that um, really believed in me and really kind of drove that, drove me to get into real estate. Uh, when I graduated college, I had a job coming out of college, but he said, Keith, um, I only want you to be in that job for less than five years. This is a corporate job? Corporate job, yep. So we, when we talked before this a couple days ago, you were talking about a lesson that you learned. So just a little snippet on that corporate job and then the biggest lesson that you learned about working for a corporation and not having something of your own? Yeah, so while I was at 3M, um, I didn't really see a lot of people that looked like me. Um, I wasn't able to connect, but I was the number one sales rep in the company at year three. And um, I got laid off. Number one sales rep in the company, they cut my so territory. So not understand how sales works with that company. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But you know, um, God works in mysterious ways, and you don't. Sometimes, I mean, you really don't know when you, you. I mean, you really don't know when He's working. Like He's working for you at all times. So I walk by faith and not by sight. And I knew at that time, like, okay, if I can, if I can survive this temporary pain, there's going to be a new and improved version of me. And what I did was they moved me to D.C. 
And that was the best thing they could have done, right? Um, so they called me back, Keith, we want you to go to DC. And when I, when, I, when I got to DC, I met Ron Butler. And Ron Butler said, you know too many people, you need to get into real estate. Wow. Now, while in corporate, I started buying real estate. And that was one thing that I, I, I think that helped me out as well because my smart goal was to make sure my rental income matched my salary because I never wanted to, be, to depend on another corporate company again. So that's when I started my exit plan. And that's a rich dad, poor dad lesson. Absolutely. And then you experience that firsthand because your, your income was just taken away from you. Just like that. And then back into what you said before, before you really got a hang on everything, you were kind of, you were spending that income and not necessarily, um, you know, using any you could to, to invest in the bank, right? So you learned a few lessons there. Yeah, I, I, I had to because, uh, you know, I, ha I had a family, I have a family to support. And one thing about uh, growing up, how I grew up around my family, I was raised by my mom, my grandfather, and my grandma, and I never wanted to let them down. And so that always stuck with me. So tell us about your family now. Yeah, so my wife, Candace, she's uh, an educator, uh, three kids. Um, oldest son, he's at Delaware State becoming a pilot. Um, we just had graduation last week. They treat these middle school graduations like high school graduation. <laughs> you know, my, my, my entire family came in town and it was a party. But uh, I'm so thankful uh, for my family. And I'm also thankful for my tribe. You know, one thing I would tell people is that find your tribe. You know, find people that you want to be in your circle. Find people that is giving you positive energy in your circle because you have to protect your peace, you know? Sometimes, and as business owners, sometimes we spend a lot of time, you know, filling a lot of people, other people's cups up. But you gotta fill your cup up as well. And that's important to remember as a business owner. You got one of the coolest mission statements that I've heard instead of asking about maybe borrow a couple pieces of yeah. really like yeah. it, constantly evolving over time. Tell us what your mission is and then, and then unpack what that looks like on a daily basis in your business and in your community. Yeah, so um, our mission is to be the bridge to our community for all things real estate, lifestyle, and wealth building. And uh, what that means is that we're not just a transactional company. You know, we're, 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 we want to make sure that for every client that we have, we're providing as many resources as possible, as possible for them. Because a lot, a lot of people come to us asking for jobs, mentors, they're asking for, you know, restaurants, they're asking for a tribe, meetup groups and things like, and things like that. So we want to make sure we're providing as much as possible. And yeah, we're going to talk real estate, but our clients stick with us for life because we are providing those resources. And that's important. Um, the wealth building piece of that is huge. As we all know, we heard, we heard it earlier, 90% of the wealthiest Americans get their wealth from real estate. We have people that come to us that never thought they could own a home. They ne it's like mind blowing, right? Some of those same people, they're on that third and fourth home through our wealth building and education. We have to lead with education and that's important. Because they don't think it's a possibility. They don't think it's a possibility. And even if they understand the importance of it, they still don't think it's possible. Absolutely. And some people may have been told that it's not, or that it's not. Uh, they, they've, they've been discounted their entire life. And sometimes when you've been discounted your entire life, you don't think anything is possible. You live in that misery every single day. And so I think I see so many people that come to me um, and you know, in the last four years, I've put more black people in homes than anybody in the country because I'm super passionate about that. Thank you. Thank you. Checked out your social media game. Yeah. Strong. You guys should find them on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, where else can they find you? Uh, LinkedIn. Uh, get my phone number. I talk. I help. I love to help people. Um, we have a podcast called All Blends Perfectly, where we talk about lifestyle, uh, wealth building, and culture. Um, and also, too, we 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 want to make sure that people like us are spreading the good gospel. Um, when I talked about how I, grew, how I grew up, you know, I didn't know what a real estate agent was. I didn't know how houses were sold. I didn't know how wealth was built, right? So it is important for us to be bringing people up with us as we're going to the top. And if, if, if we're not doing that, something is wrong.
We have to do that. That's important because I, I t people ask me all the time about social media. Keith, I was the last person to do video content. You know, I have my videographer right here today. I was the last person. The reason I started doing video, um, videography content was because um, people in my hood need to see me. They need to see me. They need to see me. And that's important. Yeah. So we still got some good questions. The reason I, I talked about that was because when I looked at, you, you told me what you were doing and some of the things that you did in your community. I looked at your social media, and one of the things that you told me was, all right, when I do an investment, I will go, go to that investment property oh, yeah. before we fix it up. And I'll say, hey, I bought this property for this amount of money. And you're, you're, having, you're having events there. You're bringing people in and yep. saying, hey, I just bought this property. This is how much I paid for it. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I think it'll be worth. And then you bring them along for that journey, sometimes in person and, in, and then also on video. And then obviously the video just, am, just amplifies the impact and lets people see everywhere. And then you come back afterwards and you say, hey, this is what, this is what we did and this is what it cost. And maybe we did spend more, maybe it didn't go right, but, but this is what the deal is. So talk through some of those. I think that's just really powerful. And I think that your, your social media, what I saw, it really made sense to me on how, you're, and how you are being the bridge and impacting the community. So kind of talk about that, how that's trying to kind of amplify the business, which then allows you to amplify the, the yep. impact. Yeah, so, so my passion in life, um, which came from the mission, um, is to be the bridge to help people get to where they want to go, right? And so what I do, if I'm doing a renovation, and I'm probably doing two to three a year, I bring lead, uh, people who call and ask about real estate, clients, past clients, into my properties before I'm, I'm done renovating them. I, I, bring it, I bring them in there when it's like super ugly, no paint, you know, raggedy, because I want them to see and feel and touch and understand. And I show them my numbers. I, show, I give them my closing disclosures. I give them my, uh, my, my, my appraisal. I show them the market rents because I think that's as real as it can get, right? This is the closing scope. I bought a property in November. Um, my interest rate was 7.3%. And you, people couldn't believe that I bought that property at 7.3%. But when I showed them the math and I broke it down to them and I showed them my margins, they were like, oh, okay, now I see it. So when you're bringing people into your universe and bringing people into your properties, they can feel, touch, and understand these investments because it's a lot of stuff, it's a lot of real estate gurus out here, but they need to be in there and see it and feel it and touch it. That's a great, I'm glad you mentioned that. There's also a lot of, a lot of gurus and I'm using some air quotes on that, yeah. that are telling people, hey, wait, because the market's gonna, you know, this is not the time to invest or because rates are too high. And the truth is it's always a good time to buy real estate. If you're buying real estate with a long-term view, like you are, like we are, like we talked about, and if you're adding value to renovations and you're mm -hmm. providing homes and opportunity, there's always gonna be need for that yep. and real estate appreciates over time and we learned that from Gary. Real estate in every single market including the biggest downturn in our lifetime in the history of our country was right. 2007, 2008. Even in the, even in the worst areas, um, so in Vegas and Florida where property values just tank, seven to ten years they were still back. So if you're holding a property for seven to ten years, it, it almost doesn't matter where you buy it in the, in the price cycle. Right? And that's the reason why. I brought people into that um, that renovation right there. I paid seven fifty for it. It appraised for eight fifteen. If interest rates were two percent, I probably would have paid nine hundred thousand for that property, right? And also, I'm going to make my cash flow. So I partnered with nonprofits to um, for returning citizens, and my cash flow. I'm going to make five grand a month on that property just because uh, I have those relationships, right? So I wanted people to come in there and see that and understand those numbers because if, they, if you don't understand the numbers and you don't understand your buy box, you gotta have a buy box. And if you don't have a buy box, it's hard to invest. And it's hard to, to, vision, to envision what your investment should look like. So that was one of my questions, so we'll get ready to answer it. What is your buy box? What is the buy box and what is your buy box? Yeah, so, so everybody have their different criteria of, of investment. You know, when I meet with clients, I ask them, you know, what are their end goals? And I kind of like to share my experiences. My buy box is got to have cash flow, um, got to have appreciation. And if it has a lot of, a lot of appreciation, you might, I, I don't care about as much cash flow, right? And you got to be able to cost seg, cost segregation. I need it to be tax, tax benefit for me. 
Someone asked me before I came up here if we're going to talk about cost segregation. I said probably not, but because you mentioned it, I love cost segregation. You just mentioned it, so go go a little a little deeper because not everybody's familiar with that. I, I have to say I wasn't super familiar with it until the last few years. But yep. It's changed changed my ability to invest. It's, yep. a, it's a great tax strategy, especially for a room of real estate professionals. That's a term of art for IRS. Uh, but the vast majority of this room would be considered a real estate professional for tax purposes with IRS. Yep. Not giving legal or tax advice, check that on your own, but <laughs> <laughs> what is so important about cost saving? Yeah, so uh, thank God I sell a lot of real estate and uh, we make good money, right? So but what we, comes with that? Uncle Sam, come yeah, knocking at your door. <laughs> yep. And I'm super transparent. Like my tax bill was super high over the last couple of years. You know, I made more money than I ever made in my life, right? And so I learned about accelerated depreciation. You know, we can appreciate a property over 27 and a half years, but during cost sake, I can take all that depreciation year one. So it lowers, it, it lowers my taxable income. And last year I was able to lower my taxable income by a quarter million just off two properties. And that was a huge tax benefit for me. So let's just, let's just play that out. Your tax liability on $250,000 that you did buy that property and did take that in advance of that uh, depreciation in your one. Yep. What do you, approximately how much would you have had to pay the IRS on that $250,000? Say 40%. Yeah, for at least 40%. Marks in the front row here, Mark. Yeah. What was 40% of the $250,000? $100,000, right? Yep. So normally you would literally you write that check out. Yep. So here you go. Here you go. But you do cost saving. You're, you've got your gross income, you've got your expenses, yep. and then you get that cost saving, which basically creates a huge expense. Absolutely. That lowers your income. You Instead of that $100,000 check going IRS, you yep. take the $100,000 check, and what do you do with it? I go buy more real estate. Buy more real estate. <laughs> yep. And then you cost saving that. Absolutely. And then you do, it's like a, it's a, it's a great cycle. Yeah. And, and, and you know, a lot of times, growing up, money was very uncomfortable talking about. Like, we don't talk about money, uh, but like at your, in your house, you need to be talking about money. To your kids, you need to be talking about money. Um, the question you should be asking yourself is, how much tax, tax deduction I need to be taking every single year? Where do I need to get my deductions at every single year? And my depreciation on my properties. So therefore, you can Try to beat, you No, know, it probably won't beat Uncle Sam, but you can beat him down just a little bit. <laughs> and, but you can't ask that question December 31st. You gotta ask that question throughout the year because you, you have to buy property in that year to write it off. Yeah. You definitely can't ask that question to your CPA on like April 15th and say, what can I do? Like, oh, it's a wrap. You need a time <laughs> oh yeah, so, and because I, I plan like that, so I know how much real estate I need to buy every single year. I know how much renovation I need to do every single year. Prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. So it's just being prepared. And we've done that in, in our Facebook blog group. We've done a lot of cost irrigation, and we kind of came up with a package and said, what, whatever my level of income is, if it's going to be this amount this year, you could ask the question in January when they said, how much real estate would I have to acquire so that I can literally wipe out my entire taxable liability yeah. and then keep that money for the down payment? And people say, well, are you just kicking the can down the road? He's well, I am. Yeah. But while I'm kicking the can down the road, I'm going to use that for that thing on another, on another property. And I'm going to probably grow the mode and build an asset, and base of assets that kick off cash flow and appreciate like you and not both are. Yep. Kicking the can down the road is a great thing to do. It is, it is. And to keep it super simple, just imagine if you can have that conversation with your clients. Like a lot of agents, they're not having conversations like that with their clients. But if you can have a conversation like that, they're going to stick with you for life. And you're going to take, you, you're going, they're going to be referring you and you're going to create raving fans. And you're going to have their whole family buying real estate. And not everybody can take it the first year. You have to be a real estate professional. There's other things along with it. But to this room, I think it's a really powerful mm -hmm. conversation. So back to a little bit of that that board had. Yep. Um, assets and liabilities. And you and I talk, and then you both have, a, I think, a lot of people have the same story. Yeah. Here. You start making money and you spend it and you don't really realize that buying assets that kick off cash flow and appreciate it the way to go. So you spend some money on some on some stupid stuff. Sneakers. I'm a sneaker head. You spend a lot of money on yep. sneakers, which, which now you can buy sneakers with some passive income, right? Absolutely. So instead of spending all your money on it. So what's your definition of an asset? 
Yeah, anytime I'm taking money out of my pocket, um, an asset is gonna be bringing money back into my pocket. That's the way I look at an asset. So it's something that's going to and can potentially appreciate. Yep, it's gonna appreciate. Cash flow. Yep. A couple examples of assets for you, obviously. Real estate. Real estate. <laughs> yep. Um, I invest. I also invest in startup startup companies. Um, business. Yep. And quite honestly, I've turned my sneakers into an asset as well. They can be. Absolutely. Those people that make some make some money. I know some some children's friends of mine that make good you know little side hustles. Yep, yep, yep. Sneakers. Uh, so then, what's a liability? Ah, oh, man, designer clothes. <laughs> that was your other. Yeah, it was my other, yeah, it was my other. Uh, any, any, thanks, man. <laughs> Suit supply. Um, anything that's taking money out of your pocket, you know? Um, and that's, I think, for me, it's the, 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 the struggle, the, the thing that I struggle with is um, you want to give your kids everything you didn't have, right? And so, a lot of times, I spend a lot of money on my kids that I probably shouldn't spend. Uh, it'll probably, hopefully, they'll look back and appreciate it, but sometimes you need to be cognizant of the, the money that you're spending and make sure you have a set budget for every month because liabilities, they creep up. They can creep up. And you don't, sometimes you don't even see them coming, right? So having that mindset and being, and being comfortable with that mindset is important. Now, there are different types of liabilities. Right. You got consumer goods. Like, let's say you want to buy a computer, you want to buy a car, you want to buy something like that, you finance it. That's a liability. Yeah. That's a debt. Um, now, an asset it's not going to appreciate. The, the asset is probably going to depreciate, maybe not give you cash flow. Obviously, a real a mortgage on is real estate. That's good debt. That's a liability, right? Yeah. And so, um, everybody's got different, you know, when you talk about Dave Ramsey, and I don't agree with Dave Ramsey, if you're a real estate investor, I agree with Dave Ramsey. Before. Absolutely. If you've got a problem spending, Dave Ramsey can give you some good advice, but telling people not to mortgage property and invest in real estate, I think, is a little dangerous. And so, obviously, you're taking on debt when you're when you're investing. So you're you're okay with taking on debt as long as it's covered real estate, appreciating, giving cash flow. I, I need that debt. You know, I need that debt to be working for me. And a lot of times, you know, um, people look at debt differently. Um, but if you're in real estate, you talk about good debt that mortgage is definitely a good debt because you can use that to write off on taxes. And also too, um, when you're building a portfolio and you're going to the banks asking for money, um, when we buy the, uh, multifamily business, the, the multifamily buildings, they're looking at that debt and they're saying, okay, you have these assets, you have this debt, and they use it as collateral. So I've been able to use like my, my, uh, the banks to borrow more money and to get lines of credits, to do more deals, to create more cash flow. So that's the reason why I love that that debt. Because your net worth is increased by you leveraging debt. Absolutely. You gotta be smart with debt, but it is, it is a tool and the largest companies in the world use debt. Because right. It does make sense on the right circumstances. Yep, and I'm able to go get other people's money. Yeah. Um, which increases your cash flow, your cash on cash return, because if you're using all your cash, your cash on cash return, it still would be a good investment, but if all your cash is out of your bank, you can't buy anything else. Right. You start using other people's money, including a bank or other group investing, so your cash on cash return goes through. Yep, even like life insurance policies. Like I, my, and a lot of times I, I do different things so I can talk to my clients about it so they can do it. Um, I borrow from my cash value life insurance policy, right? And I got a line of credit. So my money was still working for me in the market, but I was able to pull a line of credit from that and buy real estate, right? And so that was important because I was able to loan against myself at a lower interest rate, at a super low interest rate, which was super cool, and that was my first time ever doing it. Yeah, a whole life insurance. Yep. You hear a lot about that. There's a lot about that on social media. I have one. I will just say, if anybody's looking at those, there are good ones and there are bad ones. Most of the ones that are being marketed are not great because there's, there can be really big and very negotiable commissions to the agent. Um, if you were interested in something like that, see somebody who's very sophisticated around yeah. planning, because those, those policies have to be designed. Right. Um, and they you, are solid. It's, it's not correlated assets. It's not correlated to the real estate market. It's not correlated to the yeah. stock market. So but back, back to the cycle, if they're not going to go up or down with them, it's, it's dead. I would say back to that rich dad, poor dad model. You know, I didn't know all of this stuff. 
Like, I would try to find people who were sophisticated and find mentors who was doing this. Bo Benkiti is one, one of my uh, mentors as well. So I would go to him and say, hey, Bo, I got this deal. What would you do? Right? And I would sit with him, analyze this for me. And I would always reach out to him. And so he, he was the one that told me about, hey, you might want to go look at cash value life insurance policies. I've reached out to Bo a lot. He's a mentor of mine. I talked to him recently. He called me in a while. Because I learned a lot from him. Yeah. That's what's cool about this community. So tell me about back to um, you know with your mission of being a bridge for all things real estate wealth. Um, tell me about the nonprofit work you do. You mentioned three or four different nonprofit groups that you work with. Yep. I love how they're very connected to your community and to, to real estate and housing. Talk about that. Yeah. So um, we believe in group economics and we believe we believe in uh, partying with the purpose. So every event that we do. We have a nonprofit tied to it. So we sell tickets to our clients, our past clients, and they donate to a charity. Um, in two weeks, actually, one of, one of the charities I'm very, very passionate about is All Abroad Incorporated, where we're taking 12 black kids from Atlanta, Georgia to Africa. These kids have never left their environment. They've never left Atlanta before. They don't even have a passport, but they're good kids, right? And so we're taking them to Nairobi, Kenya to do service work. Wow, that's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Group economics. Yep. Which that means, uh, tell me what you mean by that. I think I know what you mean, but I just want to make sure I do. Yeah, so, you know, we like to put our money together. You know, group we like investing. Group right. investing, partnering. And so we believe that we can accomplish more uh, by putting our monies together. Me, Harrison, and Ryan, we invest together all the time. And actually, that's kind of like the, the basis of our relationship is the organic group economics. When we came together, we said, hey, we're gonna put our pool of money together and we're gonna grind it out and it's, and it's work. And we brought other people into the circle that wants to do that multifamily investing with us. And honestly, the reason we created syndication deals is because agents blow a lot of their money. And we wanted to make sure that agents were educated in saving majority of their money and investing in deals like this. I've heard Brett Tanner say, you know, we're really good about teaching people how to make money in this industry, but we're not really good, or we haven't been um, good at telling them what to do with it when yeah. they make it, and that's what you're saying. Like, hey, let's create a class of syndication or a group investment where, where we can, where people can just invest, even if they haven't learned yet, come alongside us, put a little bit of money and watch us. Well, I think that's because we talk about GCI so much. Like, I don't care nothing about, I mean, it's good. Yeah, gross commission income. We talk about that a lot. You can't take it to the grocery store. You cannot take that to the grocery store. <laughs> and it looks good on paper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, my, my mom used to always say, son, it's not, it's not about how much money you make. It's about how much, how much money you keep and save. And that's what's We're almost out of time. This has been amazing. That's why I have more questions. So, uh, what's next for you? You know, uh, that question is hard for me. Um, you know, I want to, I think I want to find more people that are passionate about real estate and bring in great agents into, into coalition. I think that I'm very passionate about that because I see myself, um, when I started this um, nonprofit work, I had a goal to sit on the board of three nonprofits for last year. And when I became involved in these nonprofits, I got a chance to see myself in these kids, right? I was, I mean, it, it, it's, it's extremely sad to see how many A plus students, 4.0 GPA students that don't even get a chance to get outside of their neighborhood. And when I go back to my neighborhood, I try to make sure I mentor as many kids as possible because of that. So I can, my, bigger, my bigger vision and bigger passion in life is making sure I can expose as many black kids as possible in underprivileged neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're, out of, we're out of time here on behalf of everybody. That, that was amazing. I was taking notes. Thank I learned you. Thank 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 you.